Welcome all my fellow Washington brethren and sister to this Louis T. Network exclusive studs and duds week number 11 in the National Football League. I want to thank all of my Patreon and Mob Squad members for your patronage. You guys are the foundation and the building block of the Louis T. Network and um, I want to continue to show my gratitude to you guys. And before I tell you how, I want to also welcome in the non-Mob Squad and Patreon members as this is a free preview of uh, Studs and Duds. And uh, happy Thanksgiving and, and season's greetings, okay? Let's call it uh, a gift of sorts. And so um, all of you are welcome to view this as well. But... Not all of you are uh, eligible for the two tickets to the Seattle Seahawks Washington football team tilt on Monday Night Football. Your man Louis T is going to give back to you guys who have given so generously to me over the years. Uh, and so I've got two free tickets to um, any member of the mob or on Patreon. Okay. All you simply have to do is use the hashtag LTN, okay? So leave a comment in the comment section of this video stating hashtag LTN, okay? Once again, if you are a member of the MOBB, does not matter what level of membership you have, or you're a member on Patreon, you're a subscriber on Patreon, Use the hashtag LTN if you are interested in two free tickets to the Monday Night Tilt Seattle at Washington, okay? I'll repeat that once more at the very end. But again, if you're a Mob Squad member, stand up. We in the building, you know what it is. Or a member of Patreon and you are interested in potentially winning two free tickets, Use the hashtag LTN to throw your name in the hat. We will do a drawing, I guess, maybe Saturday. I'll try to do something so that you'll have it in advance, know, and be able to make um, any kind of um, necessary preparation to go to the game. I might even do it as early as Friday, but I kind of want to give everyone an opportunity to you know, see the video and decide if they want to do it or not. So Saturday is probably when I'll do the drawing. Um, nonetheless... Happy Thanksgiving. So let's get to studs and duds. Week number 11, Washington's victory on the road versus the Carolina Panthers. As we customarily do, uh, we start with the honorable mentions from the game before we get to the studs. Um, let's start with the honorable mentions, the other wide receivers. Terry McLaurin was fantastic, and we'll talk about him a little bit later on in the show. But his supporting cast in this game was fantastic as well. Cam Sims with three catches. Two were huge. One was on a third down that helped convert and keep a drive alive that we ultimately scored on. Another was his great catch in the end zone when Taylor Heineke thread the needle between, between three Carolina Panther defenders. Uh, Cam Sims starting to come on and starting to contribute a little bit more since coming off of the injury. Good to have that big body target out there. We don't have a lot of big wide receivers. He's one of the few, and it's good to have him back in action. How about DeAndre Carter continuing to have his presence felt? Uh, now, this is the third straight game that DeAndre Carter has found the end zone after having not scored a receiving touchdown or any touchdown of any kind in his career before this season. Now he's got four total touchdowns on the season, one kickoff return versus Atlanta in week four, and three receiving touchdowns each of the last three weeks he's had at uh, a touchdown receiving. And then he had the huge fourth down catch and run in this game as well. DeAndre Carter continuing to be a huge factor and getting more and more snaps offensively 
for this football team. How about Adam Humphreys? Do the hump the hump. What up? Do the hump the hump. Every game, he's open and they find him in critical situations. One of the biggest plays in the game that no one really talked about was the third and 21, 18 yard catch and run by Adam Humphreys to come back to the football, make a defender miss, get up the field, and get 18 yards to set up the fourth and three Taylor Heineke to John Bates play. So uh, Adam Humphreys continues to make huge catches in critical situations. Also had a third down conversion on a slant as well. On third downs, he is money. Adam Humphreys continues to be a big time contributor. So I thought the other receivers not named Terry McLaurin stepped up and deserved an honorable mention. How about the defensive line? Only credited with one sack on the afternoon. You know, the run game for the Panthers was solid. They rushed for over 100 yards in this game. It's tough to defend that run game with Christian McCaffrey and then Cam Newton adding that element in as well. But I thought they held their own in the run game. But more importantly, I thought they collapsed the pocket and were very disciplined, stayed in their rush lanes, forced Newton back inside when he decided to keep it on the read option. I just thought it was a well played game by the defensive line I thought it was some of the best interior pressure I'd seen all season long and then when the game was on the line they were able to converge on Newton for the sack to put it away so um, you know Casey Tuhill, James Smith Williams, um, Matt Ioannidis, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen that collective group I thought was phenomenal and you know all the guys that filled in the, the gaps there as well you know, Wise and Routini and um, also uh, Tim Settle, all the guys that filled in the gaps, I thought the defensive line as a whole was an honorable mention in this game. Troy Apke, trap, okay. (laughs) For as many fans out there that love to bash Troy Apke, you'll see less of it this year because he's not actually on the field in a defensive capacity. So you'll see less and less of the Troy Apke bashing, but... Um, His presence is still felt on a weekly basis. He's still one of the best special teams players in the league. And he came up huge in this game. Panthers score a touchdown, take the lead 14-7 midway through the second quarter. DeAndre Carter returns a kickoff, fumbles the football. If the Panthers recover that ball, they're going to win the game. I think that would have changed the entire complexity of the game. Either they're getting a touchdown off of that or they're getting a field goal off of that. Either way, it's a totally different ball game. If Troy Apke doesn't somehow at the bottom of that pile come away with the football, it was a huge play in the game and it cannot be understated how big of a uh, play that was in this game, his recovery of that fumble. That could have been catastrophic. And, And literally, we talk about the ball bouncing your way. That's one of those situations where the ball bounced our way and Apke was the beneficiary of it, getting his hands on that football and recovering it. Huge play. Apke gets an honorable mention. How about Joey Sly? He's a Sly guy. Joey Sly has been perfect since coming on board with the Washington football team post by. Um, He was perfect against the Buccaneers. Two field goals, three extra points. Uh, He did it again. Um, in this game, uh, three extra points, two more field goals for Joey Sly. So um, I, I thought it, uh, once again, or I think it was two two extra points, three field goals against Tampa because he didn't kick that last extra point on the final touchdown. Uh, they elected to uh, go with the uh, kneel down so that they wouldn't have an opportunity. So uh, three field goals, two extra points against Tampa, and two field goals, three extra points against the uh, Carolina Panthers, including one where he had to kick it twice because the Panthers were off sides, and he banged that one home a second time, so from five yards closer. So you know, Joey Sly, I, I don't want to you know build him up too high because none of his kicks in this game were were that difficult. You know, there were you know one was a 36 yard field goal, another was like a 29 yard field goal. They were very close field goals, and he made all of his extra points, which you expect your kicker to make. But I don't take anything for granted. I don't take a 29 yarder for granted. I don't take a 36 yarder for granted, and I don't take a 33 yard extra point for granted. Joey Sly got it done. He is an honorable mention. Uh, how about the depth? Uh, for this football team, whether you're talking the tight end position with 
you know, having all of our tight ends be out and having John Bates step up, step up into a starting role and Sam East Reyes as your number two tight end in this football game. Or if you're talking offensive line with the continued play of this offensive line and guys stepping in, you know, we, we, we have a center go down and Tyler Lawson early in the ball game. In comes Wes Schweitzer. Schweitzer has an issue with his ankle. He leaves the game. In comes Keith Ishmael. I mean, or you're talking about the tackle position. Cornelius Lucas stepping in in the offensive line, not missing a beat when Sam Cosme went down in the second quarter. So this uh, uh, depth continues to be tested. How about Danny Johnson? I can't say enough about what he's done for this football team since stepping in the cornerback position. If I'm Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio, there's no way I can send this guy back to the practice squad. He's playing too well. He does too many things. Every week he's making a play. Had a breakup on a pass in this game on a third down to get us off the field. Danny Johnson was fantastic. Uh, I, I don't know how you find a way, uh, but you have to keep this guy on the active roster, if you ask me. Um, and then finally, the running backs. Overall, I thought it was a really banner day by the Washington football team backs from Gibson to McKissick all the way to Jarrett Patterson. All of these guys contributed in some form or fashion, uh, some more than others, but all put in their share of the work. Um, Antonio Gibson obviously had the fumble and not getting out of bounds, and, and that's what stopped this group from being in the studs category, but um, you still rush for 191 yards, you know, as a group, and you know you throw in Taylor Heineke's rushes as well. But uh, the the bulk of that yardage co came from these running backs. I thought all of them ran hard. All of them got yards after contact. All of them were physical. All of them pushed forward. And Gibson coming back after the fumble in the second half was a man possessed. 19 carries, 95 yards. I thought J.D. McKissick was huge, not only as a runner, but as a protector and a receiver in the pass game, as he always is. And I thought Jared Patterson had some impressive runs, one in particular in the fourth quarter as we're trying to run out the clock. Uh, he broke like three tackles, drug two guys, and picked up like nine or ten yards on one run. So uh, Jared Patterson uh, was excellent too. So I thought all three of these backs came in and really did human-like work. Uh, they are on the honorable mentions list as well. So now we get to our studs from the game and we start with the offensive line i always like to start with the big nasties because it starts with them and ends with them on the offensive side of the football they don't get it done up front nothing else really exists you know, taylor heineke's success won't come terry mclaurin's success won't come antonio gibson's success won't come this offense's success doesn't exist without the offensive line and i thought for the second straight week against a formidable foe they stepped up and played outstanding ball despite injuries and having to shuffle around parts they still got it done at a relatively high clip um, like I said the week before there were three sacks in the game you could probably charge all three to Taylor Heineke's account when going back and watching I like to feel like all three of those are on Heineke he could have gotten rid of the football or gotten out of harm's way in just about every one of those scenarios but that said, I thought the offensive line was fantastic. He had all day to throw on most of his dropbacks. And then they created so much space. I mean, I can't tell you how many runs these running backs had in this game where they were up the field five, six yards before even encountering their first defender. So, I mean, the space created by this offensive line was massive. And uh, the running backs took advantage of that. But it starts up front with this offensive line. And uh, they got it done again. And I can't say enough about this offensive line. They've really been the backbone of this football team for pretty much this entire season. They've had one or two games where they haven't had their best performance. Denver and, and the Chargers come to mind. But outside of those two games, I thought this offensive line has been one of the pillars of this team's success on the offensive side of the football. Um, you go to the next stud in this game, and it's, Quarterback Taylor Heineke. I mean, what more can I say? 16 to 22, 206, three touchdowns, managed the game beautifully, distributed the football, got it to uh, the right guys at the right times, it seemed like, uh, made some big time throws. You've all seen the social media posts by Nikki Javala of him, you know, kind of threading the needle to Cam Sims on that touchdown 
pass where he's throwing it into this tight, small window. You know how it is. Somebody in the uh, MOBB, I can't remember who it was, said, look at that tight window throw from Heineke for the touchdown. And, and that's exactly what it was. In the red zone, you got to make tight window throws. He was able to do that on that play, throwing it through a small little pinhole uh, between three Panther defenders to get it in there to Cam Sims. That throw to Terry McLaurin is one of my favorite Heineke throws of the season to this point. It's just a beautiful anticipation, anticipatory throw by Heineke over the linebacker, um, away from the safety that where only Terry can get it. Uh, it's a beautiful throw in, in, in a perfect location with great touch and anticipation. Um, Heineke was fantastic. The fourth and three, man. I, 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 all, I've run out of things to say about the fourth and three. I've, I've said this already many a times. I continue to say it. It gives me Robert Griffin III versus the New York Giants vibes from 2012, the fourth and 10 that he completed the Logan Paulson. This gave me those vibes all over again. Uh, big play in the game. It's tied at 21. You know, Ron decides to go for it, and, and he made Ron Rivera right with his play there. Had some big runs in the game. Uh, took a big shot on a run where he got a first down. Got up and grilled the, the safety that hit him and gave him, or I think it was a corner, Justin Burris, that hit him and gave him a little bit of work. And, and Heineke is showing that he's the leader of this team and that he's ready to take that position by the horn. So thought he was fantastic in this game, and he was a stud. Um, Terry McLaurin, I mean, you know what it is. El Capitan, you know, Scary Terry, whatever you want to call him, 17 is the real deal, okay? And uh, he did it again in this game. Five catches, 103 yards, and a touchdown. And it really could have been a lot more if Heineke doesn't miss him on that opportunity um, to score a touchdown where we settled for a field goal. Uh, that's his second touchdown of the game, and it's another 30 yards or so tacked on. Then there was another deep ball opportunity. I thought Terry jumped just a tad bit too soon, or else he could have come down with that, and that was a really good throw by Heineke. Could have been a little bit further out, let Terry run under it, but uh, where that ball was placed, Terry should have caught that one as well. Uh, so the day could have been even bigger for Terry, but the, notwithstanding, five catches, 103, and a touch. Not a bad day at the office for the best receiver on this team and one of the better receivers in the league, especially when the other team knows you're getting the football. Um, Cam Curl. I mean, and, and let me just say one more thing about Terry. That catch uh, to end the first quarter was massive because that's a third down throw. That's not a first or a second down throw. That's a third down throw, and that's you're down 7 nothing, and you need to wrestle back the momentum in the game, and Terry goes up and makes a play. That is a hell of a throw and catch. McLaurin was a stud. Cam Curl. I mean, him, Cam Curl between Cam Curl and Cole Holcomb and, and just a smatter of Jamin Davis, but it was mainly Cole Holcomb and Cam Curl who drew the unenviable task of having to cover Christian McCaffrey one-on-one -on -one out in space. That's the one thing you never want to have happen if you're a defensive coordinator, but it's going to happen. If you're playing man-to-man, -man, he's going to get one-on-one. -on -one. He's going to get it over the middle of the field. They're going to spread you out because they want him to have all of that field to work with. And I thought Cam Curl and Cole Holcomb were fantastic in one-on-one -on -one coverage against uh, Christian McCaffrey. There were opportunities galore for McCaffrey to break these dudes off, catch it, and run away from them with ample space to roam. And they just never gave him any daylight. If he caught it, they were right there on him immediately to bring him down. Um, if uh, there were times where they were there to knock it away. I just thought it was a fantastic afternoon by Cam Curl. Once again, he's physical. He's flying around. He's always near the football. And he's a guy that we can just trust in multiple spots to do whatever needs to be done. Led the team in tackles, did Cam Curl. He was fantastic once again. And that huge fourth down stop on Christian McCaffrey was one of the biggest plays of the football game. And just as I mentioned, the next stud is Cole Holcomb again. He's, he was the guy that covered Christian McCaffrey the most in this football game. And to limit McCaffrey to, you know, 60 yards or whatever it was receiving on the afternoon um, is, is absolutely outstanding work by this entire defense, but specifically Cole Holcomb, who really was the one that was tasked with having to run around the field and keep this guy in check somewhat. And I thought Holcomb was up to the task, and I thought he did so many good things. Had a deflection on a third down. Um, that's a great play, too. 
that you see us converging on the football earlier in the season. Guys were so wide open in zone coverage. No one was diving, looking to pick off anything, let alone getting your hand up in the, in the passing lane. But that's the second week in a row Cole Holcomb has gotten his hands in the passing lanes and batted a ball in the air. He's starting to really get a great feel for what quarterbacks are trying to do. He's getting a great feel for his drops in zone coverage. And he's getting his hands in the passing lanes and making things happen. So Cole Holcomb, a stud in this game as well. Uh, third downs and fourth downs. Third and fourth downs, uh, they're the next stud in this game. I thought the offense and defense came to play uh, in the most crucial of situations in this football game. The money down in the NFL is third down, and now it's starting to turn into third and fourth because so many teams are electing to go for it on fourth down with the analytics and how the game is played now. Fourth down is just as important as third down now. It didn't used to be that way because there weren't as many fourth down attempts in a ball game, but now you're seeing two to three of these you know, by each team in just about every game it seems like now. So uh, third downs are still huge. And Washington started off the season as bad as one could possibly start defensively on third downs. Uh, but for the last couple of weeks, really the last four weeks going back to the Green Bay game, um, I still feel like, you know, those numbers might not have you know been really a great representation of what this defense was doing. But you could see if you were watching closely that they were trending in the right direction defensively. And specifically the last two weeks against Tampa and now this week, uh, holding Carolina to two of nine on third downs that's that's just that's winning football you got to get off the field in the most important situation we did that on defense but to make matters even better this offense took the opportunities given to them by the defense finding a way to get off the field on you know seven of the nine third downs and they took it upon themselves to convert six of 13 third downs on offense. So you're keeping the football. You're giving yourself a chance to have a fresh set of downs and some more plays to be called to see if you can't make something happen. So, you know, to almost go 50% on offense and to hold the Panthers to less than 30% on defense, uh, you got to feel really good about that. And then you take it a step further and say, hey, defense, they want to go for it three times on fourth down. And you say, okay, they can have one, but they can't have the other two. And so to keep them at one of three on fourth downs, including the last two fourth downs of the game on the last two possessions to, to put this thing away, that's huge. And this defense has been spectacular the last couple of weeks, and uh, they did it again in this game. And then same thing with the offense. You, Ron decides to roll the dice twice, just like he did last week. And just like last week, you come up big on both of those fourth down um, you know, plays and one of them was supposed to be a fourth and inches where you quarterback sneak it. Instead, your center goes too quickly, and now it's fourth and six. And Ron says, I don't give a shit. Still go for it, and we get it anyway. So uh, the offense, uh, hats off to them for finding a way to convert in some crucial situations. Can't get it on third down? Let's do it on fourth down. Love it, love it, love it. The third and fourth down execution on both the offensive and defensive sides are studs for this football team. Uh, the coordinators. Jack Del Rio and Scott Turner are on the studs list. Uh, look, you know, so much is said and made of these guys when things don't go right. They're the first people to get blamed when the defense doesn't play well or the offense doesn't play well. Scott Turner's a horrible play caller. Jack Del Rio's too old and the league has passed him by. But, you know, when they start to do things well, and, the, the, and I've said this uh, many a times this season, it's about the players on the field. Jack's not calling things that differently than what he was calling earlier this season. It's not like he's ratcheted up the defensive intensity and now they're blitzing a whole hell of a lot. It's the same coverages they were playing. They're just playing them more confident and competently. That's it. And, and But Jack Del Rio, I thought he did another good job of mixing up blitzes with coverage and, and man and zone. And uh, I thought they did a really good job. They forced Cam Newton to make some good throws. And, you know, on the Christian McCaffrey touchdown to knot it up at 21, it's a hell of a throw. You know, I mean, you can't throw it any better than that. So uh, I thought he did a really good job of just mixing up things, blitzing, getting after Cam, you know, speeding up his clock a little bit and, and really pressuring him and then keeping him in the pocket as well. And you know, they did as good a job as you can do on Christian McCaffrey. The guy is an animal. And I thought they really kept him somewhat in check. I mean, the guy had over uh, pretty much 120 yards of total offense. I mean, that's a regular normal day at the office for him. And that's all you're looking to do. You're not going to stop this guy. You're not going to suffocate him. You're just looking to contain him and not let him go off for 230 all-purpose yards. And we were able to do that. So 
Uh, Jack Del Rio, hats off to him. And same with Scott Turner, second straight week where he's made a, a concerted effort to stick with the run, whether it's working or not working, to continue to run the football and, and stay in manageable down and distances. Uh, I thought he did a really good job with mixing some things up. I thought there were a couple of times where he got cute. You know, the, the play action fake that resulted in, in, in a sack where you've got John Bates sifting across the formation to pick up Hassan Reddick and he can't get there in time. And Heineke took a super deep drop and ended up running into the sack. I thought that was a little cute there, you know what I mean? But um, I don't have a problem with it because if it works, what a play call. But it didn't, so I'm not going to be overcritical uh, there. I-, I thought he did a really good job of mixing things up. You know, he got cute with the little, you know, fake handoff. You know, fake toss handoff to DeAndre Carter. It almost didn't work in terms of a fumble. Heineke barely got the handoff to Carter, and then it got blown up by Jeremy Chin, and that was a loss. But, you know, I I thought he just did a really good job of spreading the Panthers out, running the football, sticking with the run, no matter who was in the game, whether it was J.D., um, you know, Jarrett Patterson, or Antonio Gibson, and then allowing Heineke to be a distributor, you know, putting him in positions to get the football to different guys. Just thought it was a well orchestrated game plan and well executed on the field. Kudos to Scott Turner. And then finally, head coach Ron Rivera and his return to Carolina. I thought for the second straight week, he had a really good grasp and feel for what was going on in the game. The only thing I didn't like in this game from Ron was the challenge. And I didn't blame him for challenging it, but uh, he wasn't going to win that challenge. Uh, to me, the only reason you challenge that play is if you saw a clear recovery by Washington, which there wasn't one. The Panthers recovered that fumble. So there was what, I, what you were really challenging was to have a 14-yard gain essentially erased. I didn't like that challenge, not in the second half. You know, 14 yards is cool, but the likelihood of that not being two you know, backwards passes to then throw a forwards pass or having that first lateral be... Uh, backwards but I, I just I didn't think you were going to win that thing uh, and the only thing that that would have been worth the challenge for me would have been if you're going to get the football and we didn't recover it so I didn't like that challenge but outside of that I thought Ron continued to show why he's riverboat Ron and continued to show that he's got a good grasp of what's going on during the game I thought the management of this uh, first half clock at the end uh, was beautiful we scored that touchdown with 11 seconds left gave the Panthers absolutely no time to do anything uh, beautiful execution of the clock there. Um, I thought the decision to go for it even after the false start was ballsy. I loved it, and I thought it was the right decision because the Panthers to that point hadn't really stopped us. And so to to go for it there, to get it, and, and again, it, it looks great when you're right. And Washington's offense made him right for the second consecutive week. Um, but I just thought Ron, you know, having a feel for the game, knowing when to go for it, when to press the gas. How about going for it on that fourth and three? After being third and 21, right, you get 18 on the pass to Adam Humphreys, and now it's fourth and three, and Ron didn't hesitate. We're going for this. I love it. You know, and so Ron pressed all of the right buttons, and then I was at home debating after the offsides penalty on the field goal attempt that was 41, then was 36. It was fourth and two. A fourth and seven was then made a fourth and two after the offsides penalty. I was debating, hey, Ron, send the field goal team off the field, send the offense back on the field. They can't stop us. Ron's like, nah, it's tied at 21. We need these points. We need to take the lead. It was the right decision. He didn't get caught up in, man, we should go for it. He took the points. It was the right decision. Ron pressing all of the right buttons. Um, he is a stud in this game as well. Now you get to the duds from this game. Um, and you obviously have to start with Gibby's fumble and then not getting out of bounds on the final drive. Look, I thought Antonio Gibson had a strong performance uh, and would have been in the, the studs category if not for these two gaffes on the day. But they happened, and we have to talk about them. That fumble uh, could have been a game changer. You're, you're driving to respond to the Panthers touchdown. You're, you're inside the 15 yard line. You're looking to get points, whether it's a touchdown or a field goal remains to be seen, but you're going to get something out of this, at least an attempt at something. And you cough it up and the Panthers recover. Uh, you, you just can't have that. He, he fumbled against Green Bay in the red zone. We luckily recovered that one. He fumbled against the Chargers. That was a massive fumble in that game. And then he fumbled again in this game. This is something that has become a bit of an issue and something that we have to clean up. And so 
Um, he got benched. He came back. He, he ran hard. And then you get to the final drive of the game. Everyone knows you got to stay in bounds. He knew he needed to stay in bounds. I think he was going after the first down. And he felt like if I get this first down, nobody cares about me going out of bounds because the game's over. But he didn't make it out of bounds or make the first down. And he was pulled out of bounds. I don't agree with Rivera. I don't think it was a horse collar out of bounds. It was a clean tackle. He just got too close to out of bounds and allowed a guy to you know, pretty much pull him out of bounds. And that's what you're supposed to do as a defender in that situation. Get his ass out of bounds. Get that clock stopped. Uh, Gibby can't allow himself to be put in that position. He's got to slide down before he gets out of bounds. But, um, you know, that's definitely something we can't have. Uh, those two plays in particular were duds in this game. Um, the next dud, how about the penalties in this game? My goodness, they were some costly penalties. Eight of them for 69 yards, including three personal foul penalties in the game. Really, every single Panthers offensive possession that resulted in a touchdown was aided and abetted by Washington personal foul penalties. You had the Deron Payne senseless, you know, at the end of the play, hitting one of the guys that wasn't paying attention, uh, standing around the pile penalty. That was dumb. I didn't agree with the other two penalties necessarily. Cam Curl definitely had Christian McCaffrey's face mask. But McCaffrey had his face mask, too, similar to the William Jackson, the third penalty the week before against Mike Evans. Mike Evans face masked him first, but um, they usually don't get the offensive player. They rarely do. So that one, the one that was the most egregious was the Cole Holcomb on the very first possession of the game. He literally pulled Christian McCaffrey by the nameplate to pull him towards him to then make the tackle. The, the spirit of the horse collar rule is so that you don't hurt a guy by pulling him down and buckling his knee. Okay, we call it the Roy Williams rule because that was the way he would tackle guys and people got hurt that way. Literally, Cole Holcomb used the back of his jersey to pull him towards him and then made a regular form tackle. I thought it was a terrible call and it really helped propel that Panthers drive to kick off the game. So every single one of their drives that they scored on had a personal foul penalty. They gave them a free 15 yards. We have to stay away from those types of penalties. You can't have a false start on fourth and inches when you're about to quarterback sneak. That shit can't happen. Brandon Sheriff, I, I swear, he jumped false start at least five times and they didn't call it because he's diving inside trying to get off the ball so quick. Like, we got to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Can't be giving away free yardage. Um... So we had a couple of false start penalties and, you know, and a delay a game, an ugly delay a game on a drive that ended up, uh, you know, going in reverse after getting some real good traction. Speaking of which, the next dud is the destruction of the second drive of the second half. Here we are with the 21 to 14 lead. You know, we got all the momentum in the game. We are carving up this Panthers defense and we look like we're in position and primed and poised to go get more points. And then we get a sack, and then we get a, a senseless delay of game penalty. And what was second and four is now third and 21. <laughs> like, what just happened? What are we doing? That turned into a punt. Like, that, that can't happen. You know, Ron thought about, you know, kicking the field goal. Then he sent the offense out there uh, to, to get, you know, try to draw them off sides. And then he ultimately punted, took the delay of game, and then ultimately punted. So... Can't have that, you know. That's the next evolution of this football team is you're stepping on someone's neck. When you got them down, keep them down and don't let them up. We score a touchdown there. I don't know if the Panthers make this game competitive and close. We might have a chance to run away and hide with this one. But we, we gave it up on that drive, and that's what kept them in the game, and they ultimately took that punt, moved it all the way down the field, and tied the game up at 21. And then finally... This is something that has to talk, we have to talk about because coming into the season, this was a problem for him throughout his career. He hasn't lost one this season, so no one's really talking about it. And all anybody wants to talk about is how well he's played on offense, and rightfully so. And he's been dynamic. He had a return in this game that was for like 35 yards and got us great field position to start out one of our drives. Like DeAndre Carter has been massive for us this year. However, he's fumbled for the second time in four weeks. And no one has said anything about this. That fumble could have been game altering. Okay. If Troy Apke, if Trap doesn't find a way to get his hands on that football, 
and the Panthers recover, I do not think we're sitting here talking about this team potentially, you know, making a run at the postseason and trying to win the division and this, that, and the third. We're talking about another game where turnovers and mistakes doomed us and we allowed a team to beat us that shouldn't have beaten us. That's what we're having the conversation of. But instead, we're praising and we're lauding DeAndre Carter, which he deserves, but he's got to stop fumbling the damn football. That was a problem when we got him. He fumbled against Green Bay. Luckily, Taylor Heineke hustling on the play recovered that one. He fumbles in this game. Luckily, Trap doing what he does best, finds a way to recover the football. He's got to hang on to the ball. Period. End of discussion. So that was the final dud of this game. And so it was a fun game. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Want more games like this where we come out victorious, but there's still a lot of things that we can clean up and learn from moving forward that can help us become a better football team. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. want to thank all of my Mob Squad and Patreon members for their support. Remember, if you are a part of one of those two groups, use the hashtag LTN to be included in a drawing for two free tickets to Seahawks Washington football team on Monday Night Football. Once again, if you are a member of the Mob Squad or you're on Patreon and you're a subscriber there, use the hashtag LTN to enter your name in a drawing for two free tickets to the Monday Night Contest, Seattle at Washington. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. I thank you guys for joining me once again. Happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Louis T.